Hey everyone, Micah here with eBike School, and I have got another electric tractor to uncrate with you guys. I call it a, a micro loader. The thing's only like 1,600 pounds. This is not from the factory that I use to make my Nesher loaders. That one, it's you know really high quality factory. Uh, this time I wanted to try out this new factory with a new model. On the way here, the uh, end of the crate already fell off, so um, hopefully everything's all right in here. The whole thing just seems stapled together. I'm kind of amazed it made it all the way from China like this. And Dad, can you grab the other side there? See if you can lift this off. A little background here. So this is a very low cost model you'll see all over China and sites like Alibaba. It's copied by many factories and I wanted to check it out to see if it's something that could meet the needs of North American operators. It's also a chance to show you guys how I bring in machines and evaluate them to see if there's something I could use as a foundation for building into a good product. Alright, here it comes. Oh yeah. I had them already paint it my uh, specific color of Nesha green because I really like this color. Um, but we'll have to see if it actually becomes a, a real product here. So it looks like the bucket's not actually attached to the boom here. We'll have to lift the boom up if we want to come forward or backwards. I think these are the forks down here. Yeah, these are just folded metal. It's already not a, a great size. <laughs> Like weigh 20 pounds. <laughs> yeah, the other forks are hard to lift. These are not. Won't hold that against it yet. We'll get the thing out and evaluate it. Feels like a like a ride on lawnmower, like your old snapper. <laughs> My dad used to have the snapper from Forrest Gump. I used to ride that thing mowing the lawn all the time as a teenager. All right, when I turn the key, nothing happens. All right, let's take a look at these batteries. All right, how do I open this battery compartment? There's some sort of lock or latch here. Maybe it's just painted on. I don't know, it's not lifting up. I think it's crimped over so much, it's just... It's just too tight? Yeah. So we can try levering that open a bit. Ah, there we go. Ah, all right, that's better. Ah, I see, so they've got one wire not connected to a battery here. It's probably a good idea for shipping. Yeah, it looks like this wire here is taped to the handle that should go here is the last positive wire the fact that all of these terminals are starting to corrode is not good notice there's also no protectors on these battery terminals yeah. you can see this battery's already popped out from its spot because there's nothing holding them down let's close the hood Ugh. key it's really loud all right i'm gonna try and back up Hopefully this is forward and reverse, because I don't really know. I got to lift the boom. This one just kind of sounds angry. <laughs> Look at the little cotter pins. This thing, this thing is like a staple. <laughs> Look at these tires. Hey. Not the clutch or the brake. <laughs> 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 you were like double clutching. <laughs> yeah, I was trying to feather the brake on the way down. I don't know, you want to put a bucket or forks on it first? Let's put the bucket on it. All right. Forks totally scare me. Now, for the record, I just want to repeat that this is not my factory that I use to build my Nesher machines, and this is an evaluation. So there are a few things that are already looking a little uh, suspect. <laughs> All right, let's get a bucket on here. See how they zip tied this thing on here? Yeah, that... Oh my God, my... So there's a story behind that bike computer. I'll, I'll explain that in a minute. How heavy is this thing? Yeah, the fact that I can just like pick up and carry this is not a good sign. <laughs> oh my god. 
right. So the pins, it looks like, are just held in with these cotter pins. Yep. Which are already rusting. Shipped with no grease in them. Yeah, you're right. These are bone dry. It lines up. It seems you have high standards. <laughs> They're dropping minute by minute. <laughs> Oh, there's a piece missing from the factory. You know what? I think I found it. Yeah, I thought this was trash. <laughs> <laughs> well, that may be true, too. <laughs> <laughs> this is a piece of linkage. Look, look at this. This pain is coming off on my fingers and onto my jeans, my very expensive jeans. So it seems like we're missing a pin though, because now we need two pins. Was it in here? Did I drop it? I wonder if when they took it off to package it up, they forgot to put the pin in with it. And so it looks like they shorted me a pin. These are the pins that come in the machine. And my dad had this old axle. So I think we're gonna just have to cut our own pin here to replace the one that they forgot to include. <laughs> I've got my new pin here and my old one so we can finally get this connection in. I'll lift the boom up and let that tilt down. It's weird without any grab handles to get into this. lifting capacity of 30 pounds. Now let's try again. Yeah, well they sent me a video from the factory of it lifting itself up, so it's got at least the power to do that. Man, it just sounds angry. By the way, all of these rams, yeah. they're, they're a little wet. Oh, they're all leaking a little oil? So I don't think the seals in this are worth. And these pins, all of them came bone dry. They didn't even try to put grease in these. So I'm having to go around on each of these zerks and put grease in every single one of these. I wonder if that's part of the angry sound of this machine. I'm guessing it's only a piece of it. All right, I think I hit them all. All right, maybe now we try doing a little work here, see what happens. I think this is the loudest electric vehicle I have ever used. <laughs> All right, now the most common use of a loader is probably with a bucket doing loose material, lifting up, you know, soil, sand, dirt, gravel, that sort of thing. So I've got a few piles here, some topsoil, some sand. Let's see how it works with basic loader type operation. <laughs> I'm just gonna narrate over this bit if you don't mind, plus it gives me a chance to drop the background audio level a bit. So pretty immediately I realize I'm running into some traction issues here, especially up front. 
For all loaders, big and small, the solution here is to lift the bucket a bit to get more downforce on the front tires. And that does seem to help in this situation here, as I'm able to now drive deeper into the mulch pile. Those tires are narrow though, plus I've already dug myself a couple narrow trenches with them, so that's going to complicate things here a bit. You can definitely see how I'm bouncing out of my own trenches I dug there from the tires. And let's just do a couple more buckets for good measure. Sounds a little scary. So it seems to be working. We've got some traction issues here. It is four wheel drive, but I do notice that I'm losing traction up front. I can kind of uh, account for that by trying to lift or curl the bucket while I'm digging, get some more traction on those front tires. But it seems like if I lift too much, then I just stall out the drive motor and it's not able to continue to turn those wheels. It might be that I'm drawing too much power, you know, using the hydraulics at the same time as the drive motors. So it does seem like there's a little bit of power issue here, but if I make sure to try and just use one at a time, not drive and also run the hydraulics, then I haven't had an issue with the soil. But let's try the sand here, because sand's gonna be a little bit heavier, a little denser than soil. Here I'm still trying to get that elusive full bucket of sand. It's just hard to drive into the pile deep enough to really fill the bucket and not just get sort of the, the front of the bucket like you're seeing here. So I can tell I'm having a bit more trouble here with the sand. Part of it is the sand is a little denser, so as I'm driving into it, it's harder to cut into it and I'm losing traction. Then it's also a little heavier, so lifting, I can feel a little bit more strain on the machine. Now I can certainly take, you know, shallower cuts here, and if I was moving a lot of the sand, you know, this I feel like would, would work, but this is not ideal by any means that I can't really get a full bucket here due to the lack of traction. And so here is where, after all that talk, I really wanted to try and get a full bucket of sand this time. Maybe just to prove to myself that I could at least do it, or that the machine could do it if you force it just right, I don't know. But I was determined to get that full bucket of sand, no matter the price. Or at least until I discovered what the price would be. Okay, that was a little hairy. <laughs> All 
All right, I think we're starting to find the uh, tipping capacity of this thing. This thing is rated at 400 kilos, 880 pounds, but that is not 880 pounds of sand. And I was up on the nose on this thing. That's getting a little hairy. I don't think that the uh, 880 pound rating on this thing is uh, anywhere close to accurate. All right, let me dump this before things get even hairier. All right, I don't know how much more sand digging I want to do like that. <laughs> It doesn't articulate very much, so the turning radius is kind of big. What is this switch? Is this lights? Uh, that's the blinker. <laughs> and what is this? I have no idea. That might be lights. Here, why don't you try turning it on? Yeah, it's lights. That's forward reverse. Okay, so we did the uh, digging test with the bucket on there. It went uh, not amazing. I think with the mulch and you know light stuff, it was okay, but that heavier sand, we had a bit of a problem. Now I wanna get these forks on though and do a little fork testing because that's one of the biggest uses, at least for me, with a loader is that you can put forks on and turn it into a really multi-purpose kind of machine. Now, because of this setup, unfortunately, there's no quick hitch like with my uh, other machines where you just, you know, flip a lever up on the uh, stick there and you can swap out your bucket, your forks, whatever, straight from the seat. You don't have to get out. These, I got to pull the uh, cotter pins out of these pins, which I'm kind of worried if too many times doing this, I'm just going to break a cotter pin. Obviously, you can replace these, but still not the best uh, design here. Let's see if I can't lift this up a little bit to work easier. The other thing that seems a little bit dangerous is you don't have to be in the seat to run this. There's no dead man switch, so it can be running while you're outside of the machine. All right, there's one pin. There, pin number three is out. This is definitely not an elegant design. <laughs> Putting those dollar store cotter pins back in. The flanges are just a little bit wider on this one so the pins don't quite go in. There, good enough. Now these forks seem to just sit on top of here, which is not a confidence inspiring design. That's it. They just kind of sit there, I guess. Let's fire this back up.
in here with my first test of the forks, I'm going to try and pick the bucket up, though I'm about to get an unfortunate surprise. I was trying to pick the bucket up with the forks, they just pop right off the top. That's terrible. Oh my God. I was trying to like, you know, have an open mind and like, you know, look for the pot. Jeez. No, there's no positive here, son. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Like I didn't just want to like crap all over it right away, but. Well, you know, eventually you just have to crap all over it oh, because man. it's crap. I mean, this thing is awful. There's not one redeeming quality to this thing they literally just popped right off the top oh, yeah. i mean that's so dangerous i mean normally the forks would be mounted to the top and bottom so that doesn't happen but these just slip on and so they lifted right up when i dropped the boom down all right so maybe it'll work a little better on a pallet i mean it's bad but let's see what it can do i'm gonna get a pallet get a light one. all right found a little baby pallet maybe this is more its size <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna go find some weight to put on this thing. All right, now this is a real mini loader. I've got the uh, snow plow that we offer with these Nesha loaders here. I'm gonna put this down and see if we can pick it up with the micro loader there. No idea what that weighs. I'm guessing probably a couple hundred, maybe 250 pounds, plus the pallets, another 30. Let's give this a shot. Pick that up. Yeah, let's see if we can find a little more weight. All right, back in my Nesha loader. I've got some utility poles here. I'm gonna pull one out and see about using this as some dead weight. All right, let's get that weird little micro loader. We can't pick up one pole, that's good. All right, now I've got another one in here. I'm gonna see if I can add this. See if we can do both at the same time. I guess I can try just driving it in right on it. Yeah, let's see if it works. If not, I'll pull it out with the Nesha loader. That didn't work. Oops. Am I under the third?
Alright, so that didn't work well. Well, it exceeded the capacity. Let's see what happens. What's with... the rated capacity of this? They say 400 kilos, uh, 880 pounds. Well, let's get a real 880. Yeah. For comparison, this is my Nesher L880 from NesherEquipment.com that's actually rated for this much load. <laughs> Technically, this is also an 880 pound rated machine. But let's see what happens here. That's no problem. Not that I weigh a lot, but... Yeah. It'd be interesting to put some straps on and just weigh what these, you know, grab the scale. I think we're free. 310. 310 kilos. So that's 660, 670, 680, like 685 pounds, something like that. With 685 pounds on the other machine, we were rear wheels in the air. So that's not 800 pounds. Yeah, I mean, it was a little further out than the pins, but still. Well, this was a little further out from the pins too. But yeah, I mean, it's definitely a good comparison between like a real 800 and uh, whatever that thing is. You know, unless you just want to put this down and swap that in and pick it up while we're here, just stick it in the same loop. Yeah, we can do that. Yeah, step back a little. This one's a little jumpier. All right. Two ninety. Yeah, that's the point. Also, look at the way the fork is all skewed. Yeah, well, it's pulling in because it's not the whole the bottom. So this was an interesting learning experience. Uh, compared to an actual 800 pound rated machine, I mean, that thing didn't struggle at all. Here, it couldn't lift two of these poles, which together weighed 310 kilos, and that's like 680 or something like that, uh, pounds. So of course, you know, when you measure the lifting capacity, that's back here at the pivot pins. So we were, you know, a foot in front of it. But still, I mean, you just saw the thing was lifting right up. It's very interesting to compare those lift capacities here because you can see the difference between a machine that's rated properly and a machine like this that it seems like they just found the tipping capacity and probably backed off 10 pounds and called that the uh, actual weight rating. <laughs> I haven't done a walk around yet to show you how the loader works. Let's do that now. Interestingly, it, it actually works pretty similar to any loader out there, you know, little, big, whatever. It's the same general concept. It's a wheeled loader, so it has wheels, not tracks. It is articulating, so it's got this joint in the middle, though it doesn't articulate that much that I've found. The controls are basically identical to any other loader. Let me pop up here. So once it's running, You've got a uh, joystick over here. It's a four direction, so pushing it forward will lower the boom. Pulling it back will raise the boom. Pushing it to the right will dump the bucket or uh, tip the forks down. And then to the left will raise those forks back up or tilt them back or curl that bucket back up. Just like that. So controls are pretty simple. Man, that's loud. 
So here on the uh, dashboard, I guess, we've got a few different things. Uh, first on the left here, we've got our forward reverse. If you guys remember my electric boat video, I bought that $1,000 electric boat from China. This is actually the same exact knob for forward and reverse, and it is a huge joystick. I feel like this could be a little toggle switch. Uh, next, we have a DC voltage meter here. Uh, I actually asked them to install this for me special. This model doesn't come with a, a voltage readout. The problem is it looks like they sourced a 12 volt uh, voltage meter instead of a 60 volt meter because it's been reading 13.3 volts the entire time instead of reading my you know 65 at the top end to close to 55 at the bottom end next in the middle you'll see this bicycle meter here i asked them to install an hour meter and i went back and forth with them a few times showing them some different uh versions that they could use and in the end they just put this bicycle meter on here and when they showed this to me this was after a, a lot of back and forth already and i was like fine you know what just ship it i'll take that off you know i'll figure out my own hour meter so that's why there's a bicycle meter here next we have a little toggle switch here for our uh, blinkers which is kind of funny it's just like a mechanical switch it's uh kind of diminutive next is the key switch it's pretty obvious how that works uh this is the light switch on and off it's just strange the the different types of switch i mean all three of these could have been the same switch it's it's very strange um this is actually like the light switch I had in my 1965 Corvair that I learned to drive on. It's, it's hilarious. It's basically the same switch. And then lastly, we have uh, the stock voltage readout, which is just one of these very simple um, dot LED displays that aren't super accurate. Let's see what else. We've got our brake on the left side here. We've got our accelerator on the right. This is the battery cutoff switch down here. Uh, what else? We have working lights here, though I'm a little worried about these wires that are hanging down. The seat does fold down. I don't know why you'd need that seat to fold down. I guess if you're gonna stack things on it, but then you can't sit on it. Uh, it does have a large area back here. Sometimes I can open it. All right, it's stuck right now. But um, if you uncrimp the side here where it got a little crimped on here, I think it just got bent in shipping or something. Theoretically, this should lift up. I need to get like a claw hammer or something on there and just like bend it back open so that'll open nicely. Uh, we've got our tires here that are super narrow. There is a central motor under here that runs both the front and rear axle instead of like on other loaders like my Nesha loaders where there's a dedicated motor on the front axle and another one on the rear. This one has uh, an output with a drive shaft going forward and rear. It's listed as 2200 watts, uh, 3800 RPM, 36 amps and 60 volts. So, you know, it's not a tiny motor, but 2.2 kilowatts, it's about uh, three horsepower. It's not really a big motor either. As you can see, I mean, it's got power to lift several hundred pounds, but that's not really where the, the lifting capacity of these things come from. It's really the weight in the back of how much they can support before they tip over. All right, so let's talk about a few issues here. There are what I would say several issues with this loader. One is that the step is at a super awkward height here. First of all, with the forks, as you can see, when I just put them down now, this fork actually popped off. If I just push forward, it'll come off. I need to reset that one. This one is almost off. So some, just the forks themselves already have big problems. Also, it's, it's weird they're constructed. This one has angle iron on the top. This one is rounded uh, angle. Some, some weird inconsistencies there. But overall, there's some, some big issues that I have with this design. For one, the whole construction is just very flimsy. There's no real frame on the back half. The front half does have a decent frame here, but the rear, there's no real frame. It's just basically angle iron throughout and it's pretty thin stuff. But then there's just a lot of sort of quality control issues. The welding is okay in some places and really poor in others. There is a ton of welding splatter all over. In some places it looks like when I was in high school and I'd weld the first few times and I forgot to turn on the gas kind of thing. The pins in every location, all of these hinges here, these pins are just held in with a tiny little mild steel cotter pin that's already starting to rust out. I mean, that is a huge, critical, important hinge, and it's just held in there by a tiny little staple, basically, which is amazing that that is how they designed it to work. I, I mean, that just blew my mind the first time I saw it. Next is the material choice for everything. Like, even if you look at that bucket, that 
bucket, it's like 3.7 millimeter steel as compared to like on my Nesher loaders, that's 10 millimeter steel. So, you know, it's almost three times as thick. Just things like that that indicate, you know, the kind of care, the kind of attention that went into the design and the material choice shows how much the factory cares when they produce these. And this sort of like, at home, tiny, cheap micro loader. Like, I think they just don't expect people to put it under a lot of load, and so they build it at a much lower spec, which for me, like, I just, I can't support that. Next, there's weird issues with the paint. For some reason, the paint on the hydraulic rams is still not dry, like you rub it and red comes off on your fingers. Um, on the actual body here, there are places where the edge of the folded steel plates here are painted and then the next piece over here the edge are not painted so those are starting to rust speaking of the rams you can actually feel that some of these uh rams here are a little bit wet you can feel the oil also the banjo joints here like you can feel and even see like just a small amount of oil forming there so there's already leakage and this thing is brand new then there's the fact that none of the zerks had grease in them i mean this thing had not a drop of grease on it at all from the factory, which again, just points to the attention to detail, the care or the lack of that the factory put into this thing. Then if you come back here and you look at some of these holes through the dash here, there's wires passing through, but there's no grommet. You just have bare steel. They didn't even deburr it. So you've got the rough burrs from when they drilled these holes and then wires passing right through it, which over time is just gonna start chafing and cutting those wires and causing short circuits. Going further back here in the battery compartment, there's no restraining bar over the batteries. When it arrived, a few of them were sort of up leaning at an angle because they had just bounced out in transit. There's nothing holding those batteries down. And not to mention the fact that I paid for 110 amp hour batteries and they gave me 70 amp hour batteries. They didn't give me the upgrade I paid for. So that was wasted money. I can't believe they screwed me there. Let's see what else. I'm on a roll. Uh, the tires, the, the neighbor was watching and he said they look like bicycle tires, which to be honest, if you took a four inch fat tire and you put it up here, I think they'd actually be a similar size. I mean, these really do look like basically fat bike tires. And if anything, I was looking at the turf afterwards and I think I'm carving deeper ruts in the ground here with these tires than on my heavier loaders. And I think it's because like, if you look at the Nesha L1400, that's like a 4,500 pound machine. This is 1,600 pounds. So you know, you're talking about like almost three times less, but those tires are probably at least four times as wide, maybe five times the contact patch of these. So even though those are much bigger, heavier machines, there's less pressure on the ground from wider tires, as opposed to these have these narrow tires and they're just leaving all these ruts in the ground around here. One of the things that's kind of annoying me about this machine as I drive it around is just how little it articulates. Uh, you know, this is an articulating loader, but it just doesn't bend that far when you turn it. It's probably like, I don't know, 20 degrees or something. I'm used to a minimum 35 degrees on the uh, L880 and 45 degrees on the 1400, which is nuts. I mean, the 1400 just about folds back and turns around on itself. If you, you know, do a donut in it and you stand in the middle, you can just about touch it on either side. It is kind of crazy just how much a good articulating loader can turn around on itself, that tiny turning radius. And if you look at a machine like this that just doesn't turn very far, I get in a situation where I do like, you know, three and five point turns to turn around in a tight spot like this if I'm trying to go around Around, you know, fence posts, pallet stacks, whatever. It just doesn't give me that articulation that I really want in a nice nimble articulating loader. Oh yeah, and the, the last thing is that it just sounds so angry. Like when you turn it on, it's amazing how loud it is for an electric vehicle. I mean, that's, it's crazy. Like it's just so loud. That's the hydraulic pump running. And then if I start to turn it and lift up the boom a little, Oh, I picked up that fork. All right, when you turn it. That just doesn't sound happy. Like, this is not a happy machine. So yeah, I mean, look, here's the thing. At the end of the day, does it do work? Yeah, it does. I mean, I can pick up a stack of pallets. I can pick up one log, you know, I can move things around. I can pick up a bucket full of dirt. I don't think I can pick up a bucket full of sand because it's too heavy for it, but like it does physically function and fulfill the role of a loader. It just doesn't do most of the tasks as well as a more professional machine. Then on top of that, you have the 
lack of quality control, and the little details that are gonna cause this thing to just fail and die in early life. And that's really the issue here. I mean, when I bring these products into the US and I test and I evaluate them, I look for something that starts out good quality, but then that I can make tweaks and improve and just find the things that, you know, they don't think of in Asia, but that a North American operator would really want. And in this case, like, I wouldn't even start with this thing. This is not something I wanna put my name on. This is not something I would feel comfortable putting a warranty behind. It's just, it's not up to the par of something that could be a, functional, trustworthy product in the US. It doesn't meet those kinds of standards, unfortunately. If I just had this on my own property, yeah, you know, I could use it for jobs, I could do a little bit of work with it, and it would fulfill the role, but I worry for how long and in what state it's gonna be in after X amount of time. All right, let's rock and roll. Now I was thinking about this and there's one more thing I want to say, you know, after I just like crapped all over this thing, but I don't want this to turn into a everything made in China is crap kind of thing, because that is simply not true. Yeah, there is a lot of crap that comes from China, but if you pay good money, then you can get good things made. It all depends on the amount of care and the amount of skill that goes into production. If they don't care and they don't know how to produce something good and you don't pay very much, you're going to get crap. But if you work with a skilled factory with skilled labor and you pay enough, you're gonna get good quality stuff. Ultimately, I don't know how to build a wheel loader. Like, I couldn't produce this myself. But there are people that can, and just because they live in China or any other country doesn't mean that it's gonna be good or bad. It all comes down to who's making it and what they put into it. In this case, too many corners were cut. This is not a good product. But I don't want this to come off as a China bashing thing because that's not the takeaway message here. And just to drive that point home, remember that the thing that you're watching this video on right now was made in China by a Chinese person who knew what they were doing. And so if you like your phone or your computer, you can see that you can still get pretty good stuff. All right, now let's go put this thing away. Now it's time for my favorite part of these videos, giving away a free e-bike as part of the e-bikes for good giveaway. A program I started to find people that need a leg up in life and an e-bike could really help them out. This week I'm giving away the Muck Pet tank. So big thank you to Muck Pet. This is a 20 inch wheel folding fat tire bike. It's got a lot of cool features. 750 watt motor, so it's got a lot of power. 25 mile per hour top speed, got both the throttle and pedal assist. So if you wanna do some exercise pedal, you can do that, but you can also throttle around, which is really nice. It's got mag wheels, so no spokes, no spokes to rust out, no spoke adjustments. It's just, they're good for life. That's the really nice thing about mag wheels. Plus they look pretty cool if you ask me. Of course it is a folding bike. You know, a lot of people don't really fold these that often, but if you need to fit it in the back of a car, a trunk, a closet, whatever, it'll fold up for you. With full suspension, it's gonna be awesome for riding both off-road and on-road. So it really opens up the possibilities there. It's got a 48 volt, 15 amp hour battery. So lots of capacity there, 720 watt hours. That's gonna take you pretty darn far. I think they say something like uh, 40 or 50 miles. You know, in real life, you're gonna get less than that if you're using throttle, but still you're gonna get a lot of range out of this thing. And of course, it's got the trifecta of LED lights, a rack, and fenders. So if you're gonna be commuting, if you're out after dark, or if you wanna carry stuff, you got that covered too. And the best part of the whole thing, it's only $999 for all of that. So a really awesome deal. Now, 
who is gonna win this bike? Well, if it sounds like something that could help you out, you could really use an e-bike to get around, get back in shape, go see your kids, get to work, whatever it, the need may be. But e-bikes are just outside of your budget. You know, $1,000 is a lot to spend, and it's not something that you can swing at this time. Then I want you to head over to my website, go to ebikeschool.com slash ebikes for good. The URL will be down here somewhere. There's a form there, enter. Let me know your story. Let me know how an e-bike could help you out. And then there will be a random drawing at the end of my next video from among the deserving entrants and one person will win that free e-bike. So huge thank you to Muckpet for that. If you want that e-bike and it can help you out but you can't afford one, head over there, ebikeschool.com slash ebikes for good, enter the form, let me know how it could help you and I wanna try and get a free e-bike out to you. Now we're gonna make someone's day by announcing the winner of the free e-bike from my last video. And the randomly selected deserving entrant is... Raji. So congratulations, I really hope that e-bike is gonna be a big help. And for anybody else, make sure you enter if you think that that Mokopet bike could help you out and get you just into a better place in life, help solve some real transportation issues for you. Last but not least, it is time to announce the randomly selected commenter for my last video who will win a free copy of one of my books. And the randomly selected winner is... Let's see you travel. So congratulations, just let me know which one of my books you'd like. You can choose from DIY Lithium Batteries, DIY Solar Power, The Ultimate Do-It-Yourself E-Bike Guide, or my latest book, The Electric Bike Manifesto. And anybody else who wants a chance to win one of my books for free, all you gotta do is put a comment down below this video. You can say anything you'd like. A lot of people seem to like to type anything you'd like, and hopefully you will be the randomly selected commenter at the end of my next video. If you don't wanna wait that long to hopefully win a free copy of one of my books, you can always find my books on Amazon. All right, thanks for watching everybody. I'll see you here next time. Man, what am I gonna do with this thing now? Uh, I guess if somebody wants it and you're close to South Florida or you don't mind paying for freight, uh, here, I'll, I'll make an email address down here. You can shoot me an email. Maybe I'll find someone that wants this despite it's uh, some issues. All right, see you next time, everyone.